I'm really pleased to be here, although the scheduling, not only are there at least eight other good talks that I want to go to <laughs> on right now, but I'm the only thing between you and the bar. And uh, it's always a terrible time to be put on, but thank you for coming. It's nice to have a determined group. You know, I always prefer an audience that really wants to be here. Um, I want to start with two quotations. The first is the opening sentence of Chris Williams' excellent book, Ecology and Socialism. There is a giant death sentence hanging over much of our world. Now, if you've read Chris's book, you know that's not an exaggeration. There is a giant death sentence hanging over much of our world, and only a mass revolutionary movement can stop the execution. My second quotation is the slogan that has appeared on the masthead of climate and capitalism for seven years since we founded it. We actually borrowed and paraphrased a very famous statement by Rosa Luxemburg. And it says, said at the beginning and still says, eco-socialism or barbarism, there is no third way. Today I want to make two arguments that I think are implicit in the sentence from Chris's book and in that slogan. My first argument will be that the environmental crisis we face today is not a simple extension of ca capitalism's centuries-old war with nature. In the last half of the 20th century, roughly in the last 50 to 60 years, what Marx and Engels called the metabolic rift between humanity and the rest of nature became qualitatively wider and qualitatively more serious. And that's a very important thing for us to understand that the processes we see going on around us are a reflection of a radical qualitative shift in humanity's relationship with nature. My second argument will be that because the metabolic rift has become a global ecological abyss, Socialists today must be eco-socialists. Now that's not because the word is particularly wonderful. In fact, I have a lot of friends and comrades who hate the word. But it's because in our time, the fight against environmental destruction must, and I emphasize must, be central to the fight against capitalism. It's not enough to say that socialism is the solution. In the 21st century, fighting capitalist ecocide must be at the heart of our vision, of our program, and our activity. By way of uh, comparison or similarity, a century ago, the founders of the Communist International had to deal with what was then a new phenomenon, imperialism. And they had to make the fight against imperialism central to their work or be doomed to irrelevance. And to make that change very clear to everybody, they rewrote one of the most time-honored of all revolutionary slogans. They changed, workers of all countries unite, which of course had been central to the movement since the Communist Manifesto, and they said, workers of all countries and all oppressed peoples unite. Now, as you know, because you are involved, revolutionaries are remarkably conservative people. <laughs> they don't take well to change. And a lot of people in the common turn objected to that change. Who gave the committee the right to change the slogan? So Lenin himself took it upon himself to reply. And simply two sentences from his reply, one sentence actually. Of course, he said, the modification is wrong from the standpoint of the Communist Manifesto. But then the Communist Manifesto was written under entirely different conditions. The Bolsheviks knew that a revolutionary program has to respond to reality. 
And if reality changes, the program has to change. Today we're in a comparable situation. We face a global environmental crisis that is qualitatively more serious than anything socialists even 50 years ago could possibly have imagined. And we have to adjust our thinking and our actions to respond to that reality. We need to take the beginning points that eco-socialism offers, because eco-socialism is new. The word's been around a while, but as a body of thought, it's new. We need to take those beginning points. We need to build on them using the methods of Marxism, using the best scientific work of our time, and using the lessons we learn in struggles for change. And we need to apply our new understanding to a variety of places and circumstances. So please consider my talk today the beginning of a discussion, not as a final declaration. The idea that humanity's relationship to the biosphere has changed qualitatively during the 20th century isn't new, but it hasn't been widely discussed until fairly recently. To my knowledge, the first person to argue it explicitly was the radical biologist and ecologist Barry Commoner. His analysis of the environmental crisis published 40 years ago stands up very well today. In the 1960s and 70s when Commoner was writing the mo and the modern environmental movement was being born, most environmentalists held that the environmental problems were a result of a permanent conflict, an unavoidable conflict, between humans and nature. So the only way to stop it was to have fewer people. That view is still very common today. If you've been involved in the environmental movement, you've certainly heard it. The defenders of that view frequently point to past societies that cut down all their trees, exhausted their farmlands, or otherwise undermined the natural basis of their existence. Barry Commoner didn't deny that human activity had, dam had dam damaged or even destroyed ecosystems in the past. That would be a foolish thing to deny. But in his classic 1971 book, The Closing Circle, he argued that the modern environmental crisis was qualitatively different. In the second half of the 20th century, environmental destruction went from being gradual to being rapid. It went from being short-term and largely temporary to being long-term and frequently permanent. And it went from being local to being global. In commoners' words, quote, most pollution problems made their first appearance or became very much worse in the years following World War II. It was then, he said, and another quote, that the fabric of the ecosphere began to unravel. This unraveling, commoner showed, was closely associated with the spectacular explosion of the petroleum and petrochemical industries, which produced immense volumes of products and wastes that nature could not recycle and which at the same time stimulated a huge expansion in the amount of energy used in production and distribution and transportation. Much of a commoner's book was devoted to documenting that transformation and showing that it could not possibly be explained by population increases. He argued very convincingly that the worldwide deployment of destructive technologies that occurred in the second half, in his case, less than 30 years earlier, he argued that that deployment of destructive technologies and products was driven by capitalism's inherent need to expand. The new technologies were adopted because they were more profitable, but they were only more profitable because the corporations involved didn't have to pay for the environmental damage that they created. The environmental crisis, Barry Commoner wrote, and this is possibly the understatement of the year of all time, at least in his book. The environmental crisis reveals serious incompatibilities
between the private enterprise system and the ecological base on which it depends. Very well, Commoner is almost forgotten today. In 1970, his picture was on the front cover of Time magazine. They called him the Paul Revere of the environment. Sadly, his book, The Closing Circle, is now out of print. I keep hoping some radical publisher will choose to reissue it. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> <laughs> and sadly, Barry lost the battle of ideas in the environmental movement. The advoca advocates of population control and personal activity became dominant in the environmental movement and in mainstream ecology. Even more sadly, I have to say, the socialist left did not take up commoners' arguments. By and large, I've looked back through the socialist press of that period, and it's remarkable how little attention the left paid to what Commoner was writing, which was quite brilliant. But today, although nobody's, other than me yet, nobody's giving him credit for it, Barry Commoner's view that there was a radical environmental turning point after World War II is now winning wild, wide acceptance. In the year 2000, the Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Crutzen made a convincing case that the Industrial Revolution, roughly 1800, marked the beginning of a new geological epoch, a time when humans and human society have become the dominant force shaping our planet. Crutzen proposed to name our time the Anthropocene. The Holocene is the official term for this period, going back thousands of years. But he proposed that we should call it the Anthropocene, the new human epoch. That proposal hasn't been accepted officially yet, but it's got a lot of support among scientists. Now more recently, in the last four or five years, Crutzen <coughs> joined with the ecologist Will Steffen and the historian John McNeil to make a further proposal. And that is to divide the Anthropocene into two eras. The industrial era from 1800 to 1945 and what they call the Great Acceleration from 1945 to the present. After World War II, they write, quote, the most rapid and per pervasive shift in the human environment relationship began. They write that on, on almost every possible measure, quote, the human enterprise suddenly accelerated in the period after World War II. And if you look up their articles, they're pretty easy to find. You'll just search for Great Acceleration. They have published masses of graphs showing on things like water use, greenhouse gas emissions, paper consumption, motor vehicles, urban population. My favorite is number of McDonald's restaurants. Um, and every graph is the same shape. You got either very slow or nothing at all up till 1945, and then sort of the great acceleration, they call it. What they're doing, although they don't seem to know it, is rediscovering and documenting that what the radical environmental transition that Barry Commoner described over 40 years ago. We can only hope that they'll eventually adopt his more radical social conclusions as well. With the great acceleration, Capitalism's assault on the biosphere entered a new phase, one defined by, as John Bellamy Foster says, a qualitative transformation in the level of human destructiveness. <clears throat> as a result, we face what is usually called the global environmental crisis. A few months ago, Monthly Review magazine, uh, I justly, I think, suggested that instead we should call it the planetary emergency. It's a great term, it hasn't caught on yet, but I like it. The emergency comprises an interlocking set, an interlocked set of crises in the fundamental natural processes that have made Earth habitable for the whole time human beings have been here. The things that have made it possible for our species and many other species to exist at all are now heading into crisis. In 2009, a group of 20, 28 internationally renowned scientists associated with the Stockholm Resilience Center identified and quantified 
Nine planetary boundaries was their term that define what they call a safe operating space for humanity. That is, these are natural processes that keep the world more or less the way it has allowed us to exist. Crossing any one of these thresholds, they wrote, could have deleterious or even disastrous consequences for humans. Well, there's nine of these. We have already crossed three of them. And we are getting close to the red line on four of them. <coughs> so seven of the nine critical planetary boundaries are close to or in the danger zone now. Climate change, of course, is the, most, the best known and most critical one. The Stockholm study says that once the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere passes 350 parts per million, the climate system becomes increasingly unstable and catastrophic tipping points become possible. As you probably know, the level is now over 400 parts per million. So we are now solidly in the climate danger zone. We are also over the red line for interference with the nitrogen cycle, which results primarily from overuse of artificial fertilizers, and for, the, and for loss of biodiversity caused by the highest rate of species extinction in tens of millions of years. Many scientists are describing our current period as the sixth great extinction, equivalent to the time when a comet hit the Earth and wiped out not just the dinosaurs, but 90% of all species in a very short order. Now, there's a tendency when we discuss these environmental crises to say that catastrophes will happen if we don't, hap we don't act soon. In 10 or 20 years is the usual number you get. Well, that's sort of true, but it's misleading. In reality, catastrophic change has already started. According to the Global Humanitarian Forum, which is a think tank headed by the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, there are already 300,000 deaths every year that would not have happened without climate change. Nearly half of those deaths are children aged five years or younger, dying in agony mostly from diarrhea or malaria, diseases whose frequency and intensity has been massively increased by global warming. Now think about, we hear numbers like that all the time. Let's think about it more concretely. Every 20 seconds, a small child dies because greenhouse gas emissions are out of control. No society that permits that to happen deserves to be called civilized. And no society that causes it to happen deserves to continue. Another study shows that in the year 2012, over 30 million people were forced out of their homes by climate and weather-related disasters. By way of comparison, in 1945, after six years of total war, there were about 40 million refugees in Europe. Now, in one year, three-quarters that many are displaced by climate disasters in one-sixth of the time. But temporary displacements caused by storms and floods are only a small part of the environmental refugee story. The United Nations estimates that one-third of the people who live in the urban slums of Africa are there because advancing deserts and failing farms have made their traditional homes uninhabitable. In Asia, in Bangladesh alone, over 400,000 people move into Dhaka, the capital city, every year. Those are environmental refugees, mostly facing rising waters. And that's only the beginning. Now, I don't intend this to be a list of disaster stories, although it certainly could be. The point here is the global environmental crisis is already here. The planetary emergency is upon us. It is already killing and displacing millions of people, and it requires action now. If we can't act, it will get worse. International agreements say that the global average temperature increase should be less than two degrees Celsius over the pre-industrial level to avoid disastrous climate change. Many scientists say the level should be lower, but let's take the two degrees. 
If current trends continue, there is no chance of staying below two degrees. And there's a strong possibility that the increase will be twice that. Recently, the World Bank, a well-known organization of uh, wild-eyed tree huggers, <laughs> warned that even if all countries meet their commitments to reduce greenhouse gases, the world is likely to warm by more than three degrees Celsius, and if they don't meet their commitments, global warming could exceed four degrees C as early as the, as the 2060s. The World Bank report has a very provocative title. It's called, Turn Down the Heat, Why a Four Degrees Warmer World Must Be Avoided. And the World Bank's president write, wrote the foreword, and here's what he says. The four degrees scenarios are devastating. The inundation of coastal cities, increasing risks for food production, potentially leading to higher malnutrition rates, many dry regions becoming drier and wet regions wetter, unprecedented heat waves in many regions, especially in the tropics, substantially exacerbated water scarcity in many regions, increased fre frequency of high intensity tropical cyclones, and irreversible loss of biodiversity, including coral reef systems. Most importantly, he says, a four degrees C world is so different from the current one that it comes with high uncertainty and new risks that threaten our ability to anticipate and plan for future adaptation needs. That was last October. Last month, the International Energy Agency said that even if all of the current promises are kept, quote, the long-term average temperature increase is likely to be between 3.6 degrees and 5.3 degrees, with most of the increase occurring in this century. But you know, nobody expects the worst polluters to keep their promises. They don't expect it themselves. Emissions are not slowing down, they're speeding up. And the world is speeding into climate hell. What's worse, the climate crisis is only one of the nine planetary boundaries or the seven that we got trouble with. Even if by some miracle, greenhouse gas emissions were reduced to zero tomorrow, first, we're going to head for a lot of global warming anyhow because of past experience. But in addition, the other planetary boundaries would be in danger because nobody is even working on them. What humanity faces in this century is not just the deterioration of the conditions in life in one area or even one country, as was characteristic of environmental problems until the last decades. The metabolic rift is now global, and there is now a very real possibility that it will throw all of humanity into a new dark age that all our dreams of a better world will be replaced by unending nightmares. That's not an exaggeration. Now, I think, to move on to the second part of my talk, I think most socialists and socialist groups would agree with what I've said so far. Capitalism is destroying the earth, and socialism is the solution. And yet, when I compare the socialist literature on the environmental crisis, with the actual socialist response globally and nationally, I'm struck by a continuing gap between theory and practice. You know, I have a shelf full of books. Well, I have many shelves full of books. But I've got two shelves that I just put Marxist books on the environmental crisis. Many of them do a very good job of describing the crisis, of identifying capitalism as the problem, and usually in the last half of the last chapter, saying socialism is the solution. But almost none of them links those two processes together or discusses how do you build a movement that copes with this and takes us from one stage to the next. You read these books, and it's almost as though Karl Marx had written, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, and what the heck, that's enough. <laughs> As Nick Davenport wrote recently in an article we published in Climate and Capitalism, socialists have tended to treat the environmental crisis as a stick to beat capitalism with, 
and as another proof that capitalism has to go, but not as an arena of the class struggle in which we must be fully committed. That's not to say that no socialists have been involved. I, in fact, there's some remarkable activity of socialists in, in the environmental movement. But the, the involvement has tended to be individual and tended to be sporadic, and it's rarely been treated as a strategic priority by socialist organizations. That needs to change. As I said earlier, in the 21st century, socialists must be eco-socialists. To stop capitalist ecocide, and I hope I've made the case that that's an essential task in our lifetimes, to stop capitalist ecocide, we, most, we need both the scientific analysis of modern ecology and the revolutionary socialist analysis that only Marxism provides. That's why I'm actually very excited about the recent formation of System Change, Not Climate Change, the eco-socialist contingent. And I'm equally excited about the reports I've been hearing this weekend about the involvement of ISO members and chapters in uh, environmental activities around the US. I hope that we're seeing a uh, turn in the North American socialist left towards environmental activism and towards eco-socialism. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more about eco-socialism, but before I do that, I should just pause and say that word is not copyrighted, which means that just like the word socialism, there's almost as many definitions as there are people who use the word. So all I can offer you is my own interpretation of what it means. And I certainly won't be surprised if some eco-socialists disagree with what I have to say. And I won't be surprised if I learn something that will change my mind about some things. For me, eco-socialism is not a new theory or a new brand of socialism. It is socialism with Marx's important insights on ecology restored, socialism that's committed to the fight against eco ecological destruction. Eco-socialism is not a separate organization. It's a movement to win existing red and green groups and individuals to an eco-socialist perspective. It is socialism that recognizes, in John Bellamy Foster's words, that there can be no true ecological revolution that is not socialist and no true socialist revolution that is not ecological. And it is socialism that is actively engaged in people's struggles against capitalism's assaults. <coughs> Increasingly, and this is something I think we need to gather, that what we, all of the sudden arrival of ecological activities and environmental activities and the explosion we have seen of that kind of activity in recent years reflects the planetary emergency. As it gets worse, it's reflected in people's lives and people's local experiences. It's directly affecting the lives of working people and farmers and indigenous communities and all of the oppressed. And as capitalism continues its relentless drive to expand no matter who gets hurt or what damage is caused, we will see increasing resistance. Many of these struggles are going to focus on narrow issues, and many of the participants are going to have huge illusions about what can be done within the system. That's inevitable. The worst mistake socialists could make in these circumstances and unfortunately it's a mistake that many socialists do make, is to stand on the sidelines because a given campaign isn't radical enough or because it doesn't look like somebody's preconception of what a movement ought to look like. Be prepared for stuff you haven't seen. We need to remember Marx's great insight that people in large numbers don't change themselves and then change the world they change themselves by changing the world. As Rosa Luxemburg wrote, class consciousness and organization aren't created simply by pamphlets and leaflets, but, quote, by the living political school, by the fight and in the fight. In her excellent book, Rebuilding the Left, the Chilean Marxist Marta Harnecker puts it this way. Being radical is not a matter of advancing the most radical slogans or carrying out the most radical actions. Being radical 
lies rather in creating spaces where broad sectors can come together and struggle. For as human beings, we grow and transform ourselves in the struggle. Understanding that we are many and are fighting for the same objectives is what makes us strong and what radicalizes us. I think those few sentences should be pasted on every socialist's wall. <laughs> Only through and in struggles for change can we reach and win the many people today who find it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. We need to be patient. As another famous Marxist said, we must patiently explain. Contrary to the liberals who think we should place our faith in, faith in democratic politicians, and con contrary to the advocates of minority guerrilla attacks, there is really no shortcut to creating spaces where broad sectors can come together and struggle. But we also need to be prepared, you know, while being patient, we need to be prepared for unexpectedly radical shifts. We need to learn from Turkey where a mass movement against the regime exploded from what would seem to be a remarkably mi modest environmental protest to save a park. The fight for Gezi Park and Taksim Square is not an isolated case. In our time when the great acceleration is pushing us to the edge and when capitalism's ability to maneuver on even small issues is severely limited, we will see more and more such conflicts. That's especially true in the global south, where catastrophic environmental change is a present reality, and where the fight to save the environment and the fight against imperialism are visibly and inextricably linked. But it's also true here in the belly of the beast. Lenin famously wrote that revolutionaries must not restrict themselves to, narrow, to a narrow <coughs> economic understanding of the class struggle. He said, we must be tribunes of the people, responding to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears and no matter what stratum or class of the people. In our time, that means revolutionaries must also be tribunes of the environment. We must be re respond to the best of our ability to every manifestation of capitalist environmental destructions. That's why I like the word eco-socialism. Not because we need a new kind of eco-socialism, or new kind of socialism, but because that word signals loud and clear that we don't view environmental destruction as just another stick to bash capitalism with. It's also why, and this is my, uh, <laughs> this is my own prejudice, but it's one I try to enforce. It's why I prefer to spell eco-socialism as one word without a hyphen. Because the eco part is not an add-on. It's an integral, it is and must be integral to socialism in the 21st century. We are eco-socialists because the environmental crisis isn't just a talking point. It's a planetary emergency that revolutionaries must confront as a top priority. We need to initiate and join struggles for immediate environmental aims. We need to participate not as sideline critics, but as activists, builders, and leaders. And at the same time, we need to find the best ways to patiently explain how those struggles relate to the larger fight to save the world from capitalist ecocide. In our book, Too Many People, Simon and I, that's this one, Simon and I expressed the goal of that larger fight this way. In every country, we need governments that break with the existing order, that are answerable only to working people, farmers, the poor, indigenous community, and immigrants, in a word, to victims of ecocidal capitalism not its beneficiaries and representatives. Such governments would have two fundamental and indivisible characteristics. First, they will be committed to grassroots democracy, to radical egalitarianism, and to social justice. They will be based on the collective means of the ownership of the means of production, and they will work actively to eliminate exploitation, profit, and accumulation as the driving force of the economy. Second, they will base their decisions and actions on the best ecological principles, giving top priority to stopping anti-environmental practices, restoring damaged ecosystems, and reestablishing agriculture and industry on ecologically sound principles. In the book, we make some suggestions for some of the first me environmental measures such governments might take. Um, 
Just some of them include rapidly phasing out fossil fuels and biofuels and replacing them with clean energy sources, actively supporting farmers to convert to ecological agriculture, defending local food production and distribution, uh, introducing free, and public tra uh, free public transit, restructuring existing extraction, production and distribution systems to eliminate waste, planned obsolescence, pollution and advertising, and providing full retraining to all effective workers and communities retrofitting homes, closing down all military operations at home and elsewhere, transforming the armed... <laughs> There's an ecological argument for that. The U.S. military is the worst polluter in the entire universe. Closing down all military operations at home and elsewhere and transforming the armed forces into voluntary teams charged with restoring ecosystems and assisting the victims of environmental disasters. Now, our, those, that list isn't carved in stone. If you read um, this book, What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Capitalism, uh, John Foster and Fred Magdoff have got another list of measures that I think are pretty good. I'm sure you can think of many. These I view as transitional measures. They are transitional in the sense that they are what we fight for in this society in attempting to win a new kind of government. They are the tr transitional in the sense that they're what we would see a new government do in order to take us through to the transition of the world we actually, to the building of the world we actually want to see in the long term. Measures towards what Fred Magdoff, writing in Monthly Review, in a wonderful article you should re read if you can get a hold of it, it came out a few months ago, he called it a truly ecological civilization, one that exists in harmony with natural systems. Fred wrote, listed eight characteristics that an ecological civilization, the kind we want to build, would have. It would stop growing when basic human needs are satisfied. It would not entice people to consume more and more. It would protect natural life support systems and respect the limits of natural resources, taking into account the needs of future generations. It would make decisions based on long-term societal ecological needs while not neglecting the short-term needs of people. It would run as much as possible on current, including recent past, energy instead of fossil fuels. It would foster human characteristics in a culture of cooperation, sharing, reciprocity, and responsibility to neighbors and community. It would make possible the full development of the human potential and it would promote truly democratic political and economic decision making for local, regional, and multi-regional needs. As Fred Magdoff says, a society with those characteristics would be the opposite of capitalism in every respect. Such a profound transformation will not just happen. In fact, it won't happen at all unless ecology has a central place in socialist theory, in the socialist program, and in the activity of the socialist movement. There was a time when you could make a case that environmental destruction, although serious, was no more critical than any of capitalism's other crimes. That time is past. Capitalism has driven us to a crisis point in the relationship between humanity and the rest of nature. If business as usual continues, major ecological collapse isn't just possible, but probable. And that will put civilization at risk. There is a giant death sentence hanging over much of our world and capitalism is the executioner. That's why climate and capitalism rewrote Rosa Luxemburg's famous warning to say that humanity must choose between eco-socialism and barbarism. And that's why in the 21st century, socialists must be eco-socialists and humanity needs an eco-socialist revolution. Thank you. I can't possibly 
sum up the discussion. <laughs> that was a great discussion, um, and there were any number of topics raised in the discussion that could make an entire session or even an entire conference um, from a Marxist perspective, let alone the issues. The whole issue of factory farming is a huge one. I'm not a vegan, but we certainly are going to have to eat less meat. We're going to run this world right. Um, the, what, I just want to pick up a couple of points. The issue of environmental racism is a critical one, and it's one that the movement really does have trouble with. Um, in fact, historically, one of the issues of the decline of the environmental movement in the 80s was not so much a decline as a racial split, in which the, uh, there continued to be a very radical uh, African-American environmental movement in, in the United States, which was completely off the radar for the mainstream environmental movement. And uh, that's something that we need to come to grips with. I certainly wasn't attempting to say every socialist group did terribly, but I think the history, uh, I think Chris's remarks in some ways confirmed what I said, and that is the left looked at broadly has, needs to look at this area much more seriously than we have. Um, a number of people made, I, who was the comrade who said uh, it was like um, a pitch for suicide? Um, <laughs> You know, there, sometimes that bothers us, I know, I know, and it is hard. But I, I stand with Gramsci on this question, which is the starting point for revolutionary politics is to tell the truth. We must tell the truth. And if, and if we can't do anything else, we tell the truth. So they, and the truth about this is not pleasant. It is not a good news story. But lying isn't going to get us anywhere or trying to come up with a clever way of concealing the truth. I agree with the comrades who said we also have to talk about our vision. And that's something I think we have not been strong at. I think uh, climate and capitalism has been weak at it. It's something that I keep trying to figure out how we're going to do. Um, so I think that that's having a clear vision of what the world could be like is part of this struggle. Um, a number of people these days are talking about the need to resurrect a utopian view and not in the abstract sense of, you know, build a perfect model of a world, but in the sense of we need to build a better world. Let's start talking about what we expect it to, what we want it to be like. I tried to do that in this talk. One of the things that I think we might want to think about, because a lot of the discussion was how are we going to make the coalition into the leadership of the movement? And I'm not, first of all, you don't, leadership is not um, announced. <laughs> it's something you earn. And we will have to pay a bit of a price for the fact that other people have been there doing stuff before us, and we're going to have to work with those people, and we should, and we can learn from them. And, the, and I agree with the comrade uh, Michael, I think, who said the way you get listened to is by being identified as a person who's serious about this stuff, not by, you know, oh, by the way, you know, let's, let's talk about socialism now. Um, there's another component that I think we should think about. John came at it from one angle, but... Uh, from another angle, there are environmental aspects to almost any struggle you're involved in. Um, and it, look for opportunities to take the, take the environmental movement into the other areas you're working with, into Palestinian work, into the women's movement, into the, you know, the fight even for prisoners' rights, the number of prisons that are built in places where the air isn't breathable. Um, there's a host of issues that you can think of with that. Um, all the racial questions are huge. In Canada, the real leadership of the environmental movement in Canada are the indigenous people, the First Nations. Um, and uh, that's a, a fact of a, a real movement that exists that many of us are playing catch up on. Strongly endorse the comments on Murray Bookchin. Of uh, the anarchist writers, he is superb, and in fact, most of what Murray Bookchin has to say about the environmental movement is substantially better than what any Marxists were saying in that period. I didn't always agree with, I don't always agree with Bookchin, and I, I think some ways, some things I would love, I wish I could, he was alive so I could go and argue with him about some of those things, but boy, did he get a lot right. And what he got wrong, he got wrong for the right reasons. So Murray Bookchin, is, if you're not familiar with his work, we've been publishing what we can by him on climate and capitalism. There are actually several websites that have most of his works available. Do look them up. He's a really interesting writer. Um, let me just finish uh, with one of the things about this. We had a discussion in, in one of the sessions here about whether Marxism was deterministic. Well, one of the ways it certainly isn't is there's no guarantee we're going to win this struggle. 
Um, as long ago as 1848, Marx and Engels said the class struggle will lead either to a reconstruction of society at large or the common ruin of the contending classes. And in a century of environmental crisis, the common ruin of all is actually a possibility. One factor is going to determine the outcome, and that, and I think it's the most important factor, is the involvement of people like the people in this room and by others like you around the world, actually building a movement. It's the, the, the subjective factor, as some theorists might put it. In Cochabamba a few years ago, at the biggest international conference there has been on climate justice, they adopted a people's agreement, which is a wonderful document. You should read it. It's actually in the appendix to the What Every Environmentalist Should Know About Capitalism book. And it says, humanity confronts a great dilemma. To continue on the path of capitalism, depredation, and death, or to choose the path of harmony with nature and respect for life. It is imperative that we forge a new system that restores harmony and with nature and among human beings. And for there to be balance with nature, there must first be equity among human beings. That, in three sentences, is the case for building a movement to save the world and the case for an eco-socialist revolution. Thank you. Thank you.